In this video, we're going to discuss the basics of atomic structure. Let's start by discussing some learning objectives for this video. Uh, we're going to first identify some key parts of the atom as well as the region those parts reside in. Uh, we're then going to introduce some models showing the internal structure of the atom. There's been a couple models over the year, uh, and each one is progressively better. We're going to introduce a few of them. These will be discussed more in depth later in the year. We're then going to move on to describe some basic terminology used to define that atomic structure. This is going to be basically a list of definitions. We're then going to find those that information, which is going to be located on your periodic table. And then finally, <clears throat> we're going to take all this information, we're going to put it all together, and you're going to make something new, uh, which is known as a nuclear symbol. Overall, a lot of this material is going to be review, uh, but there are a couple of new ideas kind of spotted throughout the uh, concept, so watch out for those. Now for some of the key parts of the atom itself. Uh, there are a few main components here. These two should be very, very familiar with. First of all, we'll discuss the uh, proton. The proton is a positively charged particle located in the nucleus. While the new proton is a very, very tiny particle, comparatively speaking, in the world of subatomic particles, uh, the nucleus is relatively large. And, just so we make sure that we tie this back to some of the history we've been working on in class, the proton was disco discovered by Ernest Rutherford. After he was able to identify the nucleus of the atom, he was able then to identify one of the particles located in the nucleus, which was the proton. Our next particle in the atom is going to be the neutron. Uh, as the name implies, the neutron is a neutral particle. And like the proton, it is located in the nucleus. Like the proton, uh, it is relatively large. In fact, it is almost the same as a proton. Almost the exact same mass. Uh, and again, tying this back to some of the history we've been working on, this was discovered by Chadwick. One of the harder subatomic particles to locate simply because it had no charge, which is how the other ones were found. Our last subatomic particle we're going to be worried about this year is the electron. Uh, the electron is a negatively charged particle. located in the region surrounding the nucleus. <clears throat> it is significantly smaller than a proton or a neutron. Approximately 2,000 times smaller. And then finally, again, to tie it back into our history, the electron was discovered by J.J. Thompson. Uh, not only did he discover the electron, but he also discovered subatomic particles in general. So he's the person that got this whole process up and running. Continuing our discussion on the parts of the atom, we now can talk about some regions in the atom, some of which of these have already come up in our conversation. First region that was discovered would be the nucleus. <clears throat> the nucleus is the very dense core of the atom. So the nucleus is the very dense core of the atom. When you're talking about density, approximately 99.99 plus percent of the total mass of the atom resides within the nucleus. Surrounding that nucleus is something we call an electron cloud, is the area surrounding the nucleus. This area accounts for 99.99 plus percent of the total volume of the atom. And when you start thinking about these two terms together here, this 99% of the total mass and this 99% of the total volume, you start to get a very interesting picture of how separate these two regions are. I once heard an analogy that discussed the comparing the nucleus to the total size of the atom, which is the electron cloud where the nucleus could be a pin, 
uh, that stuck into the 50-yard line of Gillette Stadium, that pinhead would represent the nucleus and the entire stadium itself would represent the electron cloud. So you got to start to get an idea of scale here, which in most models is actually depicted very, very poorly. All right, to round this discussion up there, we have one more term we want to talk about, and that is the term nucleons. A nucleon is any particle that is in the nucleus. So basically, we're talking collectively here of protons and neutrons. So we're collectively discussing that. A lot of times, we'll talk about protons and neutrons as a group, and then electrons will be an entirely different uh, discussion, which is why we have the term nucleons in order to talk about them collectively. Now let's take some of these uh, term some of this terminology here and see if we can apply it to one of the pictures of the atom. The first modern model of the atom was something known as the Bohr model. Uh, when you worked on this in earlier years, you probably worked with something similar to this picture over here, uh, which has your protons and neutrons located in a dense core of the atom, and then surrounded you have these concentric rings of electrons. This model has been further stylized uh, during the atomic era into a picture that looks something like this, an attempt to make it three-dimensional. The reality of the situation is that neither of these pictures are an accurate representation of the model of the atom itself. Uh, this picture here has some uses, but neither of them shows what an atom really looks like. Taking it one step further, uh, years later, Erwin Schrödinger was able to come up with a new model of the atom uh, that is considered the contemporary model of the day. And as you can see over here, the picture is a lot more complex than what we were talking about before. Basically, in a nutshell, what Schrödinger did was he replaced the rings from the Bohr model with something new called orbitals. And these orbitals are these complex three-dimensional shapes, and there's actually many more of them than are depicted in this picture. This was done because of a lot of new theories that came down the road that suggested that Bohr model, Bohr's model was missing some pieces. Schrodinger was then able to add it. But again, this is a topic we'll discuss in more depth uh, later in the year. Now let's talk about some terminology that describes some of those internal parts of the atom, a way we can use common words uh, so we all know we're talking about the same thing. A lot of these are going to seem very familiar to you. We'll start with the first one, atomic number. Uh, by definition, atomic number is simply the number of protons in an atom. The atomic number has the uh, extra distinction of also being the way we identify an atom. So the identity of an atom is determined by its atomic number. Hydrogen is the element hydrogen because it has one proton. You can change the neutrons, you can change the electrons, you can change anything else. It's that number of protons that makes it hydrogen. The next term which should be familiar is atomic mass or atomic number. These words can be used somewhat interchangeably, although they do have subtly different meanings. Uh, the atomic mass <coughs> is e equal basically to the total mass of our atom. And we actually have an equation for this. The atomic mass is going to be equal to the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. And this equation is going to be very valuable for us a little later on in the game. Uh, you'll notice that electrons don't show up anywhere. If you recall from before, uh, an electron is 2,000 times smaller than the mass of a proton or a neutron. And even if we have a lot of them in that atom, they're never going to add up to an appreciable amount that's going to affect this total. One thing to point out, another term that shows up in this area is this guy, atomic weight. Atomic weight is something a little bit different and we'll have a video later on that discusses the differences between atomic weight and atomic mass or mass number. Continuing our terminology, the next word I'd like to discuss is the term charge, or as sometimes it is used, oxidation states. This is a more technical term for the word charge. Uh, it's a hard word to define. Best way I've come up with saying it is the net positive or negative electromagnetic field that surrounds an atom. So the net positive or negative electromagnetic field that surrounds an atom, and this is caused by a difference in the number of protons and the number of electrons. If you recall, the protons are the positively charged one, electrons are negatively charged. If we have equal numbers, they cancel each other out, but if we don't, we're going to end up with a net positive or a net negative. Just like before, 
there's an equation. Charge is equal to the number of protons minus the number of electrons. And built into this equation is the positive and negative sign. Finally, and we've got to squeeze it in a little bit here, we have the term atomic symbol. This one's really easy. This is the one to three letter abbreviation for the element name. These can simply be found in your periodic table. Most of them are very obvious. A couple of them have some strange letters due to some Latin roots. All of this information we just talked about should be able to be found somewhere on your periodic table. Uh, hopefully you've already received one of these in class. If you have not, you'll be getting it in the very, very near future. Uh, there's lots of data located in here, but it's very important to realize that all of that data can always be found by using this guy down here. This is a key that tells you which number in each box represents what data value. If we take a closer look at that key, we can see that it shows us all the information that we're looking for. Uh, up in the top left corner here, we can see that we have our atomic number. That is this large number in the top corner of the box. Uh, another one we're looking for, you'll see that your periodic table discusses atomic weight and not atomic mass. That's this red number up here. Uh, we'll again talk about the distinction there. Here is our symbol located right here in the middle, nice and easy to spot. And then finally, one of the harder ones to locate is going to be this guy right here which is your charge or oxidation state. Many atoms have many different charges listed. Uh, typically, you're only going to be using one at a time, and that's going to be determined by the formula uh, we talked about earlier. Now let's move on to our last piece of the puzzle here. We're going to take all of this information, and we're going to combine it into something known as a nuclear symbol. Uh, the job of a nuclear symbol is to show all of the relevant data concerning that particular atom in one place. And the real key to it here is that it is a standardized symbol. All scientists use the same exact layout. As a result of that, we don't need to include a key like we needed to in the periodic table. Something last to warn you about, it's a different layout than your periodic table is. Your periodic table is made by a private company. They can lay things out however they want, and really they're just trying to squeeze all that information into those tiny little boxes. But because they're doing it their own special way, they need to include a key. We're going to do it in a standardized format, and that key is not going to be necessary. Now let's take a look at what this symbol actually looks like. Here on the screen, we've got a completed nuclear symbol with all the information associated that we're looking for. We need to talk about how to put this picture together, and we're going to do this one piece at a time. The first part of the puzzle is including the atomic symbol. This can be found on your periodic table, depending on what element is being described to you. We'll put that right there in the center. Moving onward, in the bottom left corner, we're going to include the atomic number. And remember, the atomic number is equal to the number of protons. In the top left corner, we're going to put the atomic mass, or mass number, and if you recall again, that is equal to the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. In the top right corner, we're going to include the charge of our atom. Uh, that's going to be equal to the number of protons minus the number of electrons. Now let's put all of this together, and we have what each of those individual terms is. All your responsibility is, is to be able to find these individual data values and make sure you place them in the correct place in the actual symbol itself. Let's wrap this up with a little bit of practice. I'm going to do one of these together with you to show you how it works, and then you can work on two of them on your own in the next slide. We're going to start with a carbon atom that contains seven neutrons and ten electrons. Well, we need those four pieces that we talked about in the previous slide. In the center, we want to find the symbol for the carbon atom, and if you look on your periodic table, you'll find that that symbol is the capital letter C. So we'll start with that guy in the center. In the bottom left, we want to put the atomic number. This is an easy one. Because it is the element carbon, it can only have one possible atomic number. And if you look it up on your periodic table, that's the big number on the top left corner, and that's going to be the number 6. So our atomic number here is 6. In the top left, we want to put the mass. Uh, on your periodic table, it's going to tell you that mass is 12.011. However, that's not the mass we're dealing with right now. We've got to use the mass described in this particular atom, and we'll get into what those differences are a little later on. If we have mass here, which is protons plus neutrons, we have six new protons and seven neutrons, that must mean our mass is 13. And again, this is different than what your periodic table says, but in this scenario, that's okay. Last but not least, in the top right corner goes our charge. That's going to be equal to the number of protons minus the number of electrons. 
uh, we have six protons in this atom, and according to the description, we have 10 electrons. Six minus 10 gets us the answer of negative four. And that is a completed nuclear symbol for this particular carbon atom. And that's as tough as these get. Let's take a look at a couple more on this page. Take a minute, pause the video, see if you can try these, and then in a few seconds we'll pop up some answers for you to check your work. All right, here are some quick answers for these two practice problems here. Um, in the first example, we had a nickel atom with 29, proton, 29 neutrons and 26 electrons. Nickel symbol is Ni, found on your periodic table. And because it is nickel, it must have an atomic number of 28. Those two bits of information we can find right at the same time. The mass on your periodic table is not going to help you, but you can use the number of neutrons and the number of protons to say number of protons plus number of neutrons to get this mass here of 57. Finally, the charge in the top left has to do again with the number of protons and the number of electrons that were provided here, and we're going to use number of protons minus number of electrons to get the charge right there. Same applies for the guy down here. Xenon is the symbol for the, or Xe is the symbol for the element xenon. It has an atomic number of 154. Or 54. 54 plus 80 gets us 134, which is going to be our mass. And then finally, 54 electrons combined with 54 protons gets us a charge of zero. And we typically do write the charge of zero up there uh, just so we make sure that that information is clear. During class, we're going to continue practicing this idea, um, but it's important to stress that it does not get any harder than this. It's simply a matter of knowing which number and which definition goes with each and knowing the small equation that att attaches to that. If you can remember that stuff, these guys are always going to be a piece of cake.